Hi, I'm Ermi Desai, editor of Moose Martley, and this is the Moose Martley Show. It's December and time for our monthly roundtable with my co-host John Pasalis, president and broker at Relosophy Realty in Toronto, and Steve Soretsky, realtor and lead at the Soretsky Group at Oakwin Realty in Vancouver. John and Steve, in addition to their busy practices, are well-known commentators on housing, the real estate market, the industry, and basically all things real estate. And it's always a pleasure to discuss the latest headlines with them. If you enjoy our show and find it useful, please like, comment, share, and subscribe on whatever platform you are listening or watching us on. We are on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, and more. And now, on to the show. All right. Hi. Welcome to the December edition, the holiday edition of our roundtable. I am in cozy sweater and I have a slight cold mood. How are you doing, John and Steve? Doing all right. Adjusting to the the cooler weather in Toronto. You're not in a cozy sweater today. No. (laughs) And I'm... uh... Yeah, back in Vancouver, out of the WeWork uh, phone booth there. So oh, yes. We'll have some better audio this time. I think people enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> Spice it up a little bit. All right, so we're heading into the holidays. Let's talk about the key headlines right now. And uh, actually, before we do that, why don't we just go with a general market uh, sort of update? What's going on? Traditionally, this is a quieter time of year. I know in boom times past, John, Toronto has remained really busy, mm-hmm. even in the going to the head, heading into the holiday season. Not super busy, but yeah. strangely busy. I assume this is no longer the case. Not the case this year. I mean, pretty sluggish uh, November. Uh, again, continuation, kind of some of the trends, uh, soft sales, prices dipping a little bit, at least average prices. <clears throat> um, not just month over month, but year over year. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of a dip, of course. Um, you know, the interesting thing that I found is that inventory levels, when you think about sort of months of inventory, they appear to be kind of leveling off. So they're not really trending up as much as they were. Um, and that's been driven by two things. Over the past two months, uh, the number of the sales to new listings ratio, which kind of compares the volume of new listings to sales, um, has been trending up. Uh, and that's you know usually a sign that uh, this number of sales relative to new listings is increasing, right? And that takes a little bit of heat out of the inventory. The other interesting trend in November was that we saw a huge increase in the number of people can't taking their homes off the market. Um, And this of course took some inventory out of the market. Um, And I did this just by looking at the number of canceled listings sort of in November, 2023 against November last year. I mean, to account for seasonality and last November was pretty slow as well. Uh, And I think it was, we're up about 50 something percent in terms of the number of canceled listings. So, you know, that's usually a sign that, Maybe there's some seller fatigue. They want to take it off the market. Sellers are bullish that the market's going to be stronger in the new year. And they're just saying, you know what? Let's just forget it. Take it off the market. No point in being on the market in December. December is usually pretty slow anyways. uh, And we'll try in the new year. Um, But that's what we're seeing. The market's still sluggish. It's certainly not uh, bullish right now. Um, A lot of places still sitting on the market. Um, So it's still quite slow, but it's interesting to see sellers start taking listings off the market. So, John, normally sellers don't do that uh, going into the holiday season. Isn't there the sense that you uh, don't want to be selling during the holidays or usually are these properties that are easy to show? And so normally people don't take off their properties. during. it's It's a good question. So normally sellers do take their home off the market leading up to the holidays. So if they've been in the market for a while, haven't sold you know, they'll take it off, you know, around mid-December. But this is early. I mean, to be canceling your listings in November is a little bit earlier than what we would have expected. Um, And again, I think part of that is just maybe some of those homes were on the market for a while. Sellers getting tired of it and just saying, I'll wait till the new year. So uh, it's a little bit earlier than we would normally expect to see sort of an increase in canceled listings. And Steve, what is the situation that you're seeing in Vancouver? Uh, yeah, I mean, very, very similar to to what John said, which is like, I think overall, like, there's no like sugarcoating. It's a soft housing market. Um, you know, prices are coming down a bit, but like, there's really just not a lot selling. So I feel like 
the softest segment of the market is really the condo market. Um, I think ultimately you've got more condo product. It's more of a commodity. Um, and, you know, I think we've lost the investor bid. Right. So, but you know, you look where like, you look where there's still like some like, I wouldn't say tightness, but like, there's still like a pretty strong bid and like, you know, entry level, single family detached, move in ready. Like my, like there's just, the simple answer is, is just the supply remains very limited, uh, highly in demand. People still want a house and those houses are shrinking every year in, in, in overall supply. So that segment of the market's still holding up well. Like you're really not getting much of a price discount, even with mortgage rates at, with a six in front of it. Um, but like I said, you're still seeing, you're, you're seeing swaths of the condo market, like, like in my opinion, like going no bid, which is like, hey, they've been on the market for two and a half months with no offers. And so like that's happening. Um, but yeah, to John's point, like we are seeing, uh, you know, swath of listing terminations, right? It's like, okay, we were on the market for two, two and a half, three months. We tried to sell during the fall. We're now into like early t- December. Like we're not sold at this point. We're probably not getting a bid in the next week or two. So let's just pull it off now. And we'll try again in, you know, end of January, maybe early February as the spring market starts to pick up. And um, that's really, I think, what we're seeing from, from a lot of sellers. So the inventory levels are actually dwindling. If, you know, for example, if I look at City of Vancouver detached for sale um, in November, it's the... It's the fewest number of homes for sale since 2016. And if everyone remembers 2016, I mean, that was a bull market. So there's like the stock of housing for sale and pockets, the market's still pretty low. Um, but in general, like I said, soft market prices are coming off a bit. All right. And uh, let's then turn to the next issue, which is the interest rates, whether that you think might change uh the fortunes of these markets. The Bank of Canada has just announced a second rate hold in a row. So they're holding at 5% in, on their policy rate. So what impacts do you think this will have in the short term? And perhaps even more importantly, what does this mean? Or what, might there be a bit of a pickup in 2024 next year because of this as people start to think maybe we're at the peak? I think a lot of experts are saying, suggesting we probably are. And, uh, you know, what that might mean in the minds of consumers, especially the ones you're working with or talking to. So, Steve, what do you think the impacts might be? Uh, I mean, I think it's like everyone's like, oh, this is like the realtor like answer, which is but the reality is like when rates come down, like people like it's people just run calculators, right? They run like the numbers and say, okay, what is my monthly payment? And so if you're paying, you know, if you were paying 6.4% on your three-year fixed rate, you know, two months ago, and now it's going to be, you know, 5.8, I'd argue it should be lower, but the banks aren't passing that through right now. Uh, but if we enter into the new year and it's five and a half, like it makes a difference and it makes a difference on the mortgage stress test too, and what you can qualify for. So like, in my opinion, like, you know, a mortgage rate of five and a half isn't going to like uh, reignite the market where prices are going up. But I think what it can do is it can sort of like unstick or unpause the market, right? Where you get a bit more activity, uh, you know, a bit more housing demand. And and so you get things sort of at least moving again, because it feels like there's large segments of the market that like are just like not moving at all. Um, so I think that's the thing. I mean, like, you know, people say, well, like rate cuts, markets are pricing in hundred basis points next year, whether it happens or not is anyone's guess. But like, I, I'm of the view that like, assuming the economy doesn't completely like roll over and, and, you know, you have this hard landing, but if you do get like, you know, a rate cut in March, um, for example, I do think it, it unleashes some of the animal spirits. And like, we saw that in, in this spring of 2023, right. Which is like rates were at five and a half, they dropped down to 4.7 and people came out of the woodwork. Um, and so I think there's a possibility that that will potentially play out again. Again, it's hard to say, right. I mean, John, you probably have this question all the time, but like people, like all of our clients, like, Hey, like, should I buy now? Like, where do you think prices are going to be 12 months from now? And it's like, I don't know about you, John, but like, I'm, I think I'm humble enough now at this point, you know, maybe less so in the past, but at this point to say, listen, I don't know where prices are going to be 12 months from now. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think anyone that says that they know, I I think is, is you should probably run in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So I just say like, you know, why are you buying? What are your financial situation? And is today a de- is, is today a better time to buy than it was six, eight, 12, 15, 18 months ago? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Um, I would argue that right now, like the sentiment is really bad. Like everybody, I think almost everybody's of the view that things are going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And so as a buyer, you have quite a bit of leverage right now to like throw in a low ball offer and like leverage that chip, which is, Hey, everyone's thinking things are going to get worse. Mm -hmm. But once that first rate cut comes and people start feeling a little bit better about the market, like you kind of lose a bit of that negotiating that ability. So Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of my view. I'm a, yeah, my perspective is it would be buyers. I've seen this happen before where Canadians seem to react very quickly to any, you know, ounce of good news and they'll make good news out of anything. Like we saw it after COVID when things just ripped. Uh, We saw it after 2008. It's somehow it's like we get stunned. And then the minute we realize, oh, things might be okay, housewise, everyone rushes in. And uh, I do wonder if we would see that even before a rate cut. John, are times really different now because of the magnitude, how high the rates already are, and also, you know, some signs of a economic slowdown as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's again, it's it's I'm in the camp of it's impossible to predict, but you've been I, in that camp forever. I've That's in, like I've your bunker. For sure. I mean, <laughs> but listen, I mean, I I think it's. You know, the, the way I think is important to think about it is like there's this distribution of probabilities of different events happening. And as we move on, certain things happening, you know, sometimes end up being more likely than they were in the past. Right. Uh, certainly, you know, three months ago, the fear was, well, what if re- what if fixed mortgage rates stay in the sixes for all of 2024? That is a, like a terrible outcome. Right. Um, now, the sentiment appears to be. I mean, not only the sentiment, the, the rates are going down. So we're, you know, fixed rates, if you're insured, uh, I think I just saw now people posting, you're getting them in the high fours. Uh, if you're uninsured, fixed rates are kind of moving below six for the first time in a while. Um, so again, I think the key thing is, you know, Bank of Canada's cutting is one thing, but I think it's, you know, again, the direction of inflation and the expectation of what they're going to do, because the bond yields are going to fall before sort of the bank cuts, and we're seeing that already. And if that continues, and we get even five-year rates in the fives for uninsured buyers, um, I, I mean, I think probably two things could happen. It could be different. I don't think we're going to see a, a bull market, you know, but like I think Steve said, and even you said, or I mean, like, once people start to see that, I mean, I think it does take people who are on the fence, kind of push them back in the market. I think what that would probably do for low rise homes is move us away from at least in Toronto, the number of detached homes that have been selling each month have been basically at a historic low, like even going back to the 90s. So does that inch us back up to like 15 year lows? You know, it's not again, it's not bullish. It's just a little bit better than what it was in the fall, right? And I think that's probably likely um, that you'll see a slight increase in sales. I mean, it's hard to say what listings volumes will be like. Um, So I think if rates go down into the fives, which it looks like they probably will, I think the market for low rise houses will be a little bit busier than it is today uh, in in sort of the start of next year. I'm not convinced the same dynamics are going to play out for condos because, again, a lot of condos are investment buyers. you know, and even the end users, I think end users who are buying condos, I think are far more sensitive to doing the calculation between what it costs to rent and what it costs to buy. And those numbers are still overwhelming if you are doing that, because rates are, if the, even if rates are in the 5% range, um, the, the numbers are pretty tough. So I don't know if we're going to see as much of a rebound in condos as we would in houses, but that's just, again, my guess. John, the, the, the rebuttal right now, and, and again, it's, it's a valid one. The rebuttal these days is, well, hey, rates are going down because the economy is rolling over. We're going into recession. People are going to lose their jobs. It's not good for housing. Um, but the reality is that we don't know like the nature and the magnitude of what this recession could look like. It could be a relatively modest recession, some minor job losses. It could be a hard landing. Uh, and so there's like, there's a lot of like, to your point, like the probability of distributions of like, okay, how are these scenarios? Like, we don't know. I mean, like, you know, I see TD put out a report today saying like they're not predicting any recession, uh, you know, this year or next, which I, I think is ridiculous. I would argue that we're already actually in a recession, but we haven't like, you know, the revisions will be made six, eight months from now. Um, but like I said, if it's just it's, it's you can't you can't make these predictions. All we can kind of look into say, OK, 
how is the data sort of shaping up? And I think right now we're, we're clearly in this, this soft market, but uh, yeah, if rates get back down, um, you know, I think we're looking at well, insured rates right now at 4.99. Mm-hmm. You know, if we get some more move in the bond market, so you get your, you know, you get your fixed rates back down to 4.8, maybe like, I mean, we saw that in the spring of 2023 here and, and that, that moved things. So I'm not saying that necessarily prices are going up, but it, it un, unglues or unsticks the market. So again, I don't know, in my opinion, hard to kind of predict, but. Yeah. I mean, and I do agree that the recessionary risks are still significant. I mean, we hear about job loss all the time. I mean, I'm hearing about people who are having a hard time getting a job um, who lost like, you know, very good, high paying jobs. So I think that is a factor, but I think that's why we're not going to see a return to typical sales volumes. So that's kind of, I think it's consistent with what I'm saying, where we'll probably still see sales at like 15 year lows. You know, I'm not talking about a bull market. Yeah. I think it just might be a little less but luggish, but I could be people wrong. People in Vancouver and Toronto are trained to think like either the market's going down and like you got to like kind of like hold on, wait, or it's going up 15% a year. <laughs> people don't, I guess there's almost like we're trained to like think there can't be anything sort of in between, in which between, is like you yeah. just get like flat growth for a number of years, like, like yeah. flat prices and or, you know, something of that nature. But uh, I think there's also an important asterisk to put there. Like, I think there's going to be like, you know, regardless of what happens with the rates, maybe things get a little bit better. You get a little bit more volume, but like, there's still an asterisk there in my opinion, which is like, there's going to be a lot of like winners and losers, right? Which is like, okay, you know, maybe you got like a detached house, you'd probably be fine. Uh, but you know, like some of these pre-sale buyers that overpaid, I think there's still going to be big losses there. I think there's still a lot, a lot of developers, uh, a lot of people 100%. that are in the real estate investment space that like they are, they are going to default. It is in the process of happening. Yeah. Um, and, you know, rates that are 150 base basis points lower isn't going to move the needle that 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 default is still going to happen. Yeah. And I agree with you. And I think that's an important to, I mean, we're going on a lot, but I think it's important to remember that different things can happen in different segments. I think even though I think that the low rise market might be a little bit better in the spring of next year, I think the assignment market is still going to be very challenging. And I agree with you. That's you're probably still going to see people having sort of losses and being challenged because again, the numbers don't work. So different segments can do different things. I don't think we should think about the market as doing the same thing across all house types. Well, indeed, some of the assignment market appears to continue to be going up in flames in mm-hmm. the GTA, literally. Uh, another big news story of another development out in Burlington. Uh, I do wonder, John, uh, I was going to touch upon the fact that we can't lose sight of the fact that this was a historic rate hu- rate uh, hike. Mm-hmm. And so there are still a lot of people whose mortgages are resetting in 2025, 26 in new realities uh, than the ones that they, you know, uh, had their mortgage at for a long time. You mentioned people who bought uh, in the fa- past few years who are trying to close record number of condos actually supposed to be completing in Toronto. Uh, so there's a lot of a gray storm clouds on the horizon. It seems like in the GTA, uh, and I don't know if this is a case in Toronto, in Vancouver, uh, Steve, restaurants are empty. People have somehow used like every way to try and clamp down on their spending to try and hang in there. And it does seem like that whole thing is not over yet. You know, specifically with these assignment fires, John, I've seen it said, you know, who benefits if if these things aren't completed? Mm-hmm. Um, no one really benefits. This is just some crazy person doing this. But is this really the case? You know, buying time, it seems like in real estate can do a lot mm-hmm. for projects. You know, I, I don't know. That's just my simple observation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sometimes it's all about timing. And yeah. six months from now and a year from now, the su- situation that you're in Uh, could look a lot different. So what is your sense of, I know you don't work a lot in the new build area, but are we not being alive to some signs of something really, you know, potentially disastrous going on? Oh, I think there are. I think, you know, it's tough to say what's, what's behind these things, whether it's builders who are overextended. I mean, there is an article, I think we talked about it last month about West Bank and all of the problems they're having. Uh, in Canada, uh, US, 
Um, so again, are these small low rise builders over? I mean, who knows who's causing it? Is it like the investors? Is it the builders? I mean, somebody who doesn't want them to be completed, um, you know, is behind it. So I have, you know, and, it, and I hate yeah. to say it. Is it someone who couldn't close like the distressed no person argument? I've seen it uh, floated anyway. Yeah. Um, you guys have a weird thing with lighting buildings on fire. I know it's insane. Yeah. We're, we're not doing it. Steve. Thought, I, I want to make it very clear on this <laughs> podcast and this show. that <laughs> We are not doing this, but in the Toronto area, because low rise single family homes or townhouses are such a thing, you know, yeah. they have been a big part of the story. You know, here it's not just a big condo boom. I think Steve, you were saying that um, you know, single family homes are, are rare, new ones in the Vancouver market, right? So yeah, we don't we don't build new single family detached unless you're going like an hour and a half out of the city. Right. I mean, you are in Toronto, but that's considered Toronto. <laughs> we call it the Toronto area. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So, anyways, it is suspicious a lot of these fires by the way these developments are that far out from downtown toronto um but uh anyway we don't want to speculate i think we've done enough but it is an interesting story i have seen just even our colleagues mm -hmm. in the field going well who could it be and i just find that really interesting like really anyway we'll keep an eye on who that uh what turns out of that story um so i'm surprised so overall you guys are a bit pessimistic people who have been on the sidelines like thinking should I get in and are worried about things running away again um, in the new year or mid-market at the si first sight of a rate cut, you know, in terms of prices, if prices are still holding, even amongst all this slowdown, why wouldn't I be worried that prices will be on a tear again if, when just a marginal amount of buyers jump back in? We need a deep cut in rates. Like, I mean, we need to see fixed rates go in the fours again. Uh, for, okay. I think for the market to rally, which would be significant because we were in the sixes for most of the second half of this year, right? Right. Um, so yeah, if that happens, that's what happened, uh, like Steve said, uh, a year, like in the spring of uh, of this year, 2023. If that happens, that's that's huge. I mean, yeah, you might see a bit of a rally. Tough to predict. I don't know if we're going to go that low that quickly, um, personally, but... All right. And in any case, even if prices hold or even if they come down slightly, that doesn't take away from our last story, which is the fact that Canada is in a massive housing affordability crisis. Mm -hmm. And this week we saw a throwdown. Mm -hmm. The throwdown was Pierre Polyev, who is now the leading candidate to become the new uh, leader of the federal government uh, in the next elections. Uh, just really, you know, he he had a home run this week releasing a 15 minute what he called housing documentary i'm not sure i would agree with that characterization on twitter i believe it's also on youtube and uh, just to give a sense of the magnitude of this 15 minute uh, video's impact by monday afternoon the video had 3.6 million views on twitter a much shorter video posted by prime minister justin trudeau so that's probably his rival earlier in the day had received only 175k views. So just to give you a sense of magnitude of how much attention this has garnered, it uh, it is a very well-produced video, lots of visuals. Um, certainly, you know, and a lot of people have noted this, while he is doing the voiceover, it is a lot more plain speaking, a lot less of the kind of mealy sort of political talk you hear a lot. A lot of powerful images are shown in which he first recounts a crisis that Canada is in. His emphasis when it comes to facts and figures, and there are many, is on single family home affordability, but there's also lots of images of foreign students and refugees, especially in the Toronto areas and other areas, you know, sleeping on the streets, under tunnels. And uh, as I said, very visually compelling. And then part two of it goes into his solutions. Basically, one is to stop fiscal spending or overspending as a government, because that will reduce the interest rates that affect mortgage rate holders. And the second is to reward and punish municipalities uh, so that they are no longer gatekeepers to buildings. And he really wants to emphasize um, doing that on the basis of their housing completions. So not what they say they're going to do, uh, but when they're completed, any federal monies that are going to them will then be released to them. So, um, yeah. It was, uh, it's a big, I think it was a big drop in the housing arena this week. John, what did you make of it? <laughs> um, I don't know how to say this politely. I, I I actually thought it was a bit, I mean, it was very good from a, uh, you know, communications perspective. 
uh, the way politicians are kind of communicating to the public and trying to distill ideas. I mean, I, I can't say I agree with his explanation for housing. Um, you know, I mean, I think he kind of oversimplified what's behind this. I mean, interestingly enough, he blamed quantitative easing, which obviously Canada is not the only country that did. Uh, obviously, U.S. did the same, and, and he compares U.S. as, as being an affordable country. Um, there, and if I can interrupt you, John, he didn't mention COVID once. Well, yeah, I know. In that entire five minute segment. Yeah. So, I'm, so, yeah. It's, so it's, there's it's, no reason why it happened. There was yeah, some very exactly. pointed omissions. Yeah. I invite, uh, I, we'll have it in the show notes so everyone can view it. And I fall. mean, it, and int what's interesting is he actually didn't blame the Trudeau government for sort of the, the population boom. That was obviously a big factor of this. So he's kind of taking the same narrative as the liberals, which is blaming the cities which is, a, I think, a bit of an odds take. I mean, his comparison to, to uh, what was it, to Singapore, I mean, is kind of comical, like for anyone who knows anything about housing markets, because Singapore's largely, largely publicly built housing, you know, so for, for a conservative candidate to be looking at uh, a housing market that has so much state control I mean, it really, I mean, it makes me wonder if they actually even understand what's going on in the housing markets across the world that they're looking at. So, uh, I, and, and of course, I don't know, I, I don't think his prescription and, and his solution, you, you cannot withhold funny money on infrastructure until completions are done because municipalities need that infrastructure money to build the freaking infrastructure for the housing. Uh, and we're seeing that in Ontario, like the Ford government is trying to do something similar to, incent to just basically incentivize municipalities to build more housing, their targets are based, the province wants to make the targets based on housing starts. The cities are saying that's unfair because we can't control when builders build homes. You should do it based on approvals, right? Because we're approving it. Our targets are there. They're just not building. Kaliyev wants to go one step further and wait five years for the homes to be completed before cities get their money. So it's a bit, I mean, I find it a bit odd, but that's just- I'm I'm going to throw up this slide here. Yeah, I did uh, wonder about his solutions here. Uh, I was really struck about, you know, um, the insistence that apartment buildings should be built and completed around transit areas before a drop of federal money should go to the mm -hmm. transit projects <laughs> um, which they're based on. And this is his own writing here on his slide. I'm not sure that's the gold standard of transit planning. <laughs> But uh, there was a lot in this video. Steve, what was your overall take and, and your more, uh, I guess, um, other takes? I mean, I think it's a good communication video. I think ultimately, you know, this is showing up in the polls. Um, you know, I think, you know, yeah, I don't just I don't agree with everything in terms of what our problems are and the solutions. But I think like, John, if you made a video or I made a video and we put it out there, I'm sure people are like, well, I don't agree with that. Like we see it on Twitter all the time. Right. It was like everyone's arguing about like the solutions and what we should do. And like the reality is this is an incredibly complicated issue. And I'm not convinced regardless of who's in power, whether it's Trudeau, Polyev, Jagmeet Singh, like I, I, I'm not convinced that you're going to fix housing affordability in the next decade, regardless of who's in power. So I, I think it's a complicated mess. I think that ultimately, you know, the economy has been completely mismanaged um, by the existing government. And I think that's created a lot of the issues that we have. Uh, and so, you know, but the way I would say it is, it's interesting because the conversation, like, the conversation we're having around today around housing is like very like you thought it was heated like five years ago like it's intense now like i'm talking like and the the moves and the measures that we're seeing now are i think are what's interesting to focus on which is like you know i'm here in vancouver you know we've got the city of vancouver which is like basically zoned almost entirely for single family zoning which is like mass approved multiplexes across pretty much most of the land um and then the bc government says okay we're going to one-up you and we're going to say all single family lots larger than 3300 square feet or sorry larger than 3000 square feet in bc are now allowed to build duplex triplex fourplex across the entire province they just jammed through legislation they just removed zoning capacity from the municipal governments and then on top of that they says okay we're going to also mandate you know minimum eight story up to 20 story depending on the radius of how close you are to a, a, a sky train or subway station 
And so these are just like massive, like this, this wouldn't have been possible even two years ago. So it just, it's interesting to see all levels of government now saying, okay, we're now finally realizing this is actually a real problem politically, economically. And it's, it's encouraging to see um, governments are now actually coming around. The problem is, is that the damage is already done. This is going to take, you know, I think decades to, to resolve, but um, I think we're, we're laying the groundwork and, I think ultimately um, shedding a light on those issues is, is, has certainly helped. And again, I don't agree with all the solutions that are in there. Clearly, there's some flaws around some of the data and whatnot that's been proposed. But I think any level of government is doing that. Everyone just kind of picks their, you know, John, like it's interesting, like reading all these like economic reports, like you can twist and manipulate data like however you want. Mm -hmm. Like it's really impressive. And like, obviously, like, you know, you and I being in the housing field, like, we're able to sort of identify like, well, hmm, that doesn't quite make sense. Yeah. Um, but like governments, various levels of government and policymakers will sort of pick the data that they want and they'll kind of like twist it to like create their own narrative. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, go, go ahead, John. I mean, yeah, I just want to add on Steve's. I mean, definitely the BC governments uh, probably the making the biggest changes in terms of planning and upzoning all of these things. Uh, the one thing I noticed from, I mean, their own announcement about kind of upzoning around transit lines and things like that, kind of what, you, what Steve touched on, is that when you look at their forecast of how many new housing units they think will be built in those areas uh, as a result of that, I think they said maybe, you know, if everything lines up beautifully, about something like 10,000 homes per year, 100,000 in, in 10 years, um, which is great, you know. But again, I mean, BC builds something like 30,000 homes a year or 35, I can't remember, around that range. So obviously, probably all of those are not going to be net new. There's going to be some substitution, people kind of, instead of building in some areas, looking at others. So this is, you know, and my point is, you know, even if there's, those were net new units, increasing supply by 25, 30%, uh, is is still inadequate, like in a country that's growing by 3% per year. So even though those solutions are good, uh, I think they're not just good uh, from a planning perspective. I mean, socially, they're good. Environmentally, they're good. Like having more housing around transit is, is what we should be doing. Um, they're not going to push prices down anytime soon um, because it's not enough supply to, to move the needle when we're going by 3% per year. So again, I think it's good foundationally. I think it's kind of setting ourselves up for the future. Uh, but at this rate, I think it's still going to be a challenging market. Well, yeah, John, I mean, to like to your point, I mean, this is the thing with like, you know, the, the Yimby crowd, which uh, I find insufferable, but um, <laughs> as much as we, we share something in common. Yeah, I, I, and again, I'm pro density. So like, I know but I just find some of these arguments are just like insane, which is, um, you know, if you look at it, right, like, I think all that matters, like right now is like economics, right? Which yeah. is like, okay, rates are up 500 basis points projects are no longer economically viable. You know, we've talked about a shortage of trades, the shortage of trades. So we have a shortage of trades in order to wrap up housing completions, which is like what CMHC is talking about. Like mm -hmm. we need a lot more trades people. So getting those skilled trades people is going to be a real issue. Mm -hmm. um, but not only that, so we talk about all this and there's a report out from Altus Group, who I would say is probably one of the, you know, non-biased uh, research companies out there that put out a report said that the construction sector has fired more people this year than they've hired. So the construction workforce is actually shrinking because developers are laying off uh, construction workers because the projects are no longer being started because they're not economically viable. So yeah. this is sort of like a... It's a catch twenty two, right? Because we're just like, oh, we need to round up the supplies. We need to like, we need to immigrate more construction workers. But we're actually firing more than we're hiring right now, yeah. because like the projects, it's, it's like the economics matter too. You can improve all the density you want, but if you can't pencil the the, the, the projects and nobody wants to build because you can't get bank financing, right? You need bank financing to build. And if you yeah. can't get bank financing, you ain't getting built. I mean, I th I think the Yimbies like to believe that by upzoning everything. Um... It helps it pencil, which I think there is obviously some truth to that. I mean, if you go from only allowing four stories uh, on a given street to 12, I mean, the numbers are going to be a lot better, right? 
Uh, but I still think it's even with that, I think it's it's a challenging environment because um, because of rates and everything that's going on. So, yeah, I mean, even with the upzoning, it's still going to be it's still going to be a tough to build in this environment. And again, this comes full circle to our initial conversation, which was like, it's a very complicated, hot mess. Mm -hmm. And like, there's a lot of solutions that we can do, but there's not like a one size fits all. It's it's a really complicated mess. And, and yeah, it's going to take, I think, decades to fix. Mm -hmm. Guys, 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 Pierre Polyev would think you're a very negative Nancy's. <laughs> I'm going to play this clip here. We have all the natural advantages, abundant land, labor, and lumber, the best carpenters, plumbers, framers, and electricians and home builders. We just need to get the gatekeepers out of their way and yours. I felt very hopeful. His video reminded us um, of some very interesting points. And I think the diagnosis of the problem was brilliant. But then about at 4 minutes 32, it goes into what I call the K-Pax moment. I, over that movie, decades old movie at Kevin Spacey. We don't talk about him anymore. But uh, yeah, that's when a really good movie goes three quarters in. And then all of a sudden someone's shoe threw out the story editor notes and shoehorned some other stuff in. But, um, you know, I think looking at Pierre's video, it, which was very well done in the diagnosis, but looking at the details left me um, first excited. So you don't think that his clip saying that we have the most land in the world, the most labor, the best carpenters oh is not giving me enough uh, to get us out of this housing crisis. I, I do just want to say it's not the political communication that I have a problem with. It's the point at which it gets into the tell me you're not in housing uh, analysis without telling me you're not in housing analysis. And it happens around, like I said, after 432, where uh, Pierre goes back to a grade one geography class, in which he reminds us that Canada has the biggest land mass in the world. He then goes on to tell us we have the lowest poppy density in the world, uh, one of the lowest population densities in the G7 in the developed world, which is true. This chart, by the way, that's labeled population density is confusing for our podcast listeners. It shows Canada as being at the top of uh, population density, but it does it's actually inversed. It's square footage per person. And it's true. Canada has a lot of it. And Pierre's video shows us where it is. Beautiful cattle ranch, these amazing grasslands. Now it gets really dense. And this I know this stock footage because we use it a lot in the Move Smartly. It's the GTA, row and row of uh, family homes. And then, of course, this hellhole that is downtown Toronto, <laughs> which Pierre doesn't like because you could buy a castle in Scotland uh, for the same amount of money. I have to fact check that. I'm pretty sure that's in euros. But anyways, um, the point being here is it struck me watching this video that one of the reasons we're probably never going to see a real fix on uh, housing is because real estate is housing is extremely local, very, very, very local. Uh, so Pierre has a great solution, except not everyone wants to spread across Canada. And unless we're going to become the Chinese government and have entry and exit visas into certain cities, um, you know, I don't think that's going to happen in the near future. Uh, also, John, I do find it interesting that if I map more timeline onto Trudeau's record, uh, or we look at a more detailed timeline, I'm going to try to describe this for our podcast listeners. So taking the same erosion and affordability in Canada, we start to see maybe why both, you know, Trudeau missed this completely. And I think uh, Paul F has really done well in articulating what Trudeau missed entirely. But let's take a step back and just look at the affordability issue across Canada since 1990. We actually see that it's extremely regional. Every province has its own story. And in terms of affordability, the last year in which you could say all provinces were at or below what we would define as affordability, roughly 40 percent of your uh, disposable income was back in 2003. But, you know, BC, which is that gray line in this chart at the top, has always floated above it. It's never really been an affordable market. And the rest of the provinces in Canada meet affordability now and will in the future quite easily. The CMHC report reminds us the Except biggest Ontario. problem Except is Ontario on yeah. in the yellow there. And it's funny that Ontario's uh, affordability uh, line there matches Canada's. 
which is, you know, kind of makes sense because the majority of households in Canada are located in Ontario. So where overall Canadian affordability goes, and Pierre Pagliaz's video talked about overall Canadian affordability, the, you know, it's not popular on Hockey Night in Canada, but where the fortunes of Ontario, and I would argue Toronto area specifically go, there goes the rest of Canada, at least when it goes to housing affordability. So I did find it very interesting that Polyev said, well, we have a limited population. John, he didn't bring up the population issue at all. When if you look at this chart where I've mapped uh, the, the administrations that have been elected, with Harper coming in at 2006, Trudeau coming in at 2015, the CMHC report says, OK, affordability starts to erode around 2010. So that's midway during Harper's um, a period of election. And uh, quite interestingly, that's right after the 2008 financial disaster. So low interest rate environment, again, which leads to that ramping up of house prices. That happens, uh, especially in Ontario. And uh, and then, you know, we could blame low interest rates, which, um, you know, many do. Uh, then Trudeau gets elected and we see an acceleration of that, uh, of that uh, lack of affordability. And there the story is the Trudeau administration came in with a population mandate. It said it boldly it's immigration targets. It worried during COVID when it didn't meet those targets. Once the COVID was over, Sean Fraser was very excited to announce they had retained or recovered all the foreign students that had been prevented from coming due to COVID. I have to give them credit. They didn't sneak in the population. So I do wonder a bit about Polyev here. Uh, is he just doing the average Canada thing? And so... Sure, if you take all of Canada's landmass and divide it by its population, there's no population issue. Is he being coy because he's trying to rebrand himself and so doesn't want to go into the immigration mess because he's trying to win over centrist voters? Or is he like Trudeau, maybe just unaware that real estate is super local, 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 that there isn't one real estate market in Canada that there isn't really a lot the federal government can do, but maybe measure the disproportionate impacts that its policies are having on local markets. And I really do think the immigration story, the more I look at it, is about disproportionate impacts on the GTA market, especially. Mm -hmm. So end of my chart, diatribe. John, any reactions? Well, I mean, I think, listen, I think some of his sound bites uh, are aimed at trying to tell a simple story that makes no sense. Like like you said, I mean, looking at Canada and saying we have among the most amount of land per person. I mean, it's just like the most idiotic way to think about it. The the vast, I, mean, I, I don't know what the stat is. It's like 80% of people live kind of just around the 49 parallel. You know what I mean? There's no one's living up in Northern Canada. So it's a bit silly to suggest that. Um, but yeah, I think he didn't touch on the sort of the immigration piece because which is odd because obviously that is directly at the hands of the federal government. I mean, partly because I think he's perhaps worried that he might come off as sort of anti-immigration, which is a trend we're actually seeing in European countries who are also that are also facing a housing crisis. And the politicians there are certainly trying to clamp down on their population rooms because they're impacting uh, affordability. And, and we're seeing that in the numbers. I mean, I, I tweeted out the other day, it's like two thirds of Canadians are concerned, or think the sort of immigration are too high. And of course, this is just a function of affor housing affordability. If you're worried, you can't afford a home or your kids can't afford a home. This is how people shift towards, you know, having concerns about the level of immigration. So even though that's the sentiment on the ground, I think he's reluctant to go that way. I think he probably wants to keep the population booming. Um, and it's kind of a convenient way if he comes into power to allow it and just blame the cities for not building. You know what I mean? It's kind of what the federal government's doing. So it's like an easy way to kind of maintain the status quo, but then just blame the cities if they're not building it up. It's not my fault. It's not the population. It's the cities that just aren't tripling the number of homes they build. Uh, and I think it's probably a combination of those. I don't know what Steve thinks, but that's kind of my two cents. Yeah, I think so. I think that, uh, I don't know, I think everybody just blames, you know, whoever they need to, to get into power and then, you know, say whatever you need to say to stay in power. And so I think, again, I just think it's all levels of government. I think that, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the politics is kind of tiresome in general, but um, 
Well, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, the only thing is two years from now, uh, I think two years from now, the election time, we'll see because the municipalities are opening up, as you both spoke to, massive measures to not be the gatekeepers. Uh, do they get out of their own way? <laughs> Wait before Pierre has a, a time to scold them with a stick. And let's see if development picks up in these markets. Uh, but as you both pointed out, I'm a bit worried because it's not going to solve labor. It's not going to solve that developers aren't getting the money they want or, or the returns they want. So we'll see. Um, but, you know, again, I have to give credit to, to Palia for articulating an issue. This is a complete miss by the Trudeau government. But I do really wonder if because they're the federal government, they did not see this happening at ground zero, where it really started to take hold in the GTA area first. You know, maybe it's not a vote rich place for uh, everyone to look <laughs> in many ways, because GTA actually, a lot of the area even swings a bit left. Who knows? But, to, or it's too safe. The liberals always know it's there. So I, I don't know. I think that that is one of the, the big misses from this whole thing, but let's see what happens next. And as we wrap up, uh, any cheery, cheery note to end on guys there's a little bit of a gloom i feel <laughs> what are your your thoughts Any for the new cheery year notes steve <laughs> cheery notes for your thoughts in no not music. really i don't know there's not much going on right now i just think that the, the market's are right off here for the next you know four or five weeks and you'll see what you know mid-january we'll start getting a feel of how things are shaping up so i think anyone that's trying to overanalyze in the holidays i think just uh relax and uh you know have a drink and and see where things are in the in the, in the new year see that's yeah, cheery i agree we gotta hit pause i mean I, I agree completely nothing's gonna happen in the next month but january i agree with steve january february is gonna tell us a lot about what the the spring market's gonna shape up like because it's kind of when people start calling people start looking people start you know restarting their searches so We'll probably on the ground start to see some early signs of what, how things are shaping up as we move towards uh, the new year. All right. I'm going to do what it's really hard for a lot of Canadians to do. I'm going to try and not think about real estate so much over the holidays is what I'm hearing from <laughs> you two. Yep. And try to rest and relax and regroup and be back in the new year. Thank you to all of our viewers and listeners. Keep your questions and comments coming. Uh, you can interact with John on Twitter at John Pasalis. Steve is at Steve Soretsky on Twitter. Uh, show notes will also have other contact details, emails for both John and Steve and details for the show itself. So thank you very much, John and Steve. Wishing you uh, happy holidays, relaxation. Remember, downtime, take advantage. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the new year. <laughs> <laughs>